Good morning to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today. Alan Clements here from Ubud, Bali, Indonesia at USADA Studios. Uh, today is the final sharing in this series of seven talks. Uh, the title, one of my favorites, Spiritually Incorrect. What is spiritual incorrectness? Um, what is spiritually sanctioned taboos? Um, the normalization of toxic narratives. Um, the vilification, criminalization of divergence and diversity and the authenticity of uniqueness to embrace the oddity of your abnormality <laughs> in juxtaposition with the orthodoxy of what's sanctioned within one's club or state or group or religion as acceptable behaviors or thoughts. Obviously, some hyper taboos, uh, cannibalization, cannibalism, uh, interfamily marriage, brothers and sisters, obviously incest, um, this national religious sanction utilization of one's genitals. Um, the criminalization of truth within the Declaration of Human Rights. One of the great examples is um, Julian Assange and the radical criminalization of beauty, of the role of the investigative journalist, the informed citizen, and not just the criminalizing of something so elegant and beautiful as freedom of thought, speech, and to, to share the truth across frontiers and domains that interrupts the elite, the deep state, the hyper-orthodoxy of who controls the economic forum, who controls the Rothschilds. I mean, the taboo of even calling existence flawed, as it was frequently referred to in the circles of Orthodox Buddhism that I frequented in Burma, in the Theravadan Buddhist tradition, that those who see reality rightly see that it's inherently flawed, and therefore one, figuratively speaking, seeks to challenge the collusion, the complicity with the orthodoxy of tyranny, which is the beauty of the Four Noble Truths, is that we do not sanction dukkha as beautiful. Dukkha is the flawed nature of contextual existence based upon ignorance, or call it fusion or compactness, where the identity upon the fabric of this compactness gives the appearance of something valuable to pursue. And yet, based upon a Nietzsche, the flaw of impermanence, the lack of control from a permanent objective control tower, anatta, one is, so to speak, subjected to the conditions known as the laws of conditionality, paticca samuppada, or karma, that you cannot control existence sufficiently to be at peace no matter what, unless you, you know, do the exit samsara, the ES, which is so taboo for people who are driven by the, the beauty of existence and you're a pessimist. Pessimism is taboo. And there's so many areas that we walked on broken existential glass, so to speak, to not protrude or step upon the so-called 
normalcies of what we've endorsed as the club of my spiritual Vipassana-based East Coast, West Coast, South American, Peruvian, Buddhist, Thai, Sri Lankan orthodoxy of my trans cult with my hierarchy of men and women who are the air holders, so to speak, of that truth and how we tolerate hypocrisy, how we tolerate idiosyncrasies, how we tolerate ways in which we think, speak, and behave that are inconsistent with the ways in which we think, speak, and behave publicly or even privately or even to our psychiatrist or to our psychologist or to our own teacher. The collusion of sociopathy is so deep, we wouldn't even dare admit that we're folded in the ways that we're folded because we, what? We have fetishes or desires for pharmaceutical drugs or existential crack cocaine called religious ideology. Uh, the fetish to be enlightened when in fact you're just an ordinary, beautiful, human, flawed individual. And the hierarchy of that, that, that concept over the normalcy of shadow and darkness and inconsistency and flaw and flaw and the obedience that we have to the cult of orthodoxy. And all these words point to the strange, maddening miracle of embeddedness that we're intrinsically born into against our own so-called will. You know, that birth takes place independent, seemingly, of choice. The context that we're born into seemingly takes place without agreement or contract. The randomness and the craziness and the so-called lawfulness that we attribute to this great schema called context. And you know, just pause and just to open the narrative a bit to include the full range of all the episodes of Game of Thrones, the normalization of call it societal, mythological, existential, spiritual kink, the craziness of, of, of culturally sanctioned, artistically imbued, the turn on that they championed of rape, of incest, of murder, of the unthinkable happening as an expression of suspense and intrigue and artistic integrity, right? That we are willing to binge on a series on Hula or Amazon or Netflix, but in society, oh my God, I wouldn't even dare bring that up to my psychedelic assisted trans psychiatric hyper integrated alt oriented, you know, awakening to my nuanced, polyamorous, beautiful kink style of sexual exploitation and joy. But no, no, I'm a PhD in orthodoxy and I see the necessity of keeping how I live and think and dream and not just pleasuring oneself through sexual, sensual masturbation, but just cognitive masturbation by reading the New York Times and the state-sanctioned propaganda of, of twisting narratives to the point where we are paralyzed in this kind of strange complicity of agreement with American sanctioned funding of genocide and the incredible proxy support for murder of my life based upon my adherence to paying tax dollars to therefore to avoid criminalization of avoiding my proxy to murder. 
And this samsaric mess that we're embedded in, to open to it with any degree as, I would call it awakened, more courageous mindful intelligence, rather than the orthodoxy of belonging to the cult of the beauty of all these hyper exaggerated states called happiness or stillness or calm, all the ways in which we, I would call it the imbue upon the maddening miracle of present time, authentic feeling, the horror show of what it means to be in an awakening trajectory to feel reality on the terms of the fucking way in which it's presenting itself. Just look at the day of the life of the 160 boys and girls and the nuns and monks that have immolated themselves in the forgotten country of Tibet in the last 15 years. The gentlemen, the Air Force um, American military personnel who walked to the scene of the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. and recently took his iPhone out and drenched himself in kerosene and lit himself a fire. I don't want to be complicit with genocide. And you, you can't ultimately criticize him, but he, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the nature of the human beast. America is a genocidal culture that empowered the politic of legitimate vilification and mass murder of the animals, the buffalo, and the American Indians. And it happened wherever white, Western, Protestant, Catholic, Christian predators fled out of Europe and the UK. And wherever these patriarchal toxic narratives went, it either disposed ordinary indigenous cultures by either outproducing them or mass murder or both. And in the name of something committed genocide to further the idea of Western civilization. And welcome to the human beast, the human narrative, the human animal. And I, you know, I, I don't know that there's a point to a talk like this, except for me, why I do the World Dharma Forum and why I do the talks that I do and meet the people that I meet and write the books that I write and the films that I choose to want to explore is furthering the dialogue of willingness to courageously include and to know a little bit more mindfully of my thought, speech, and action and how it intrudes or impacts others, to be radically sensitive to impact, but at the same time utilize the greatest gift that we have, one of the greatest gifts, is th the use of our mind and thoughts and our conscience and our dignity to further the sacredness of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which are inalienable freedoms that all people, all cultures, irregardless of religion or economic or gender or opportunity, have the right to be supported in the freedom of thought, the freedom of speech, the freedom of curiosity, the freedom to explore through behavioral norms of agreement What's an appropriate exploration of your intimacy, your sexuality? And to me, some of the most striking examples of spiritual correctness and religious correctness is this, the, the, the state-sanctioned compliance to sign up for war, murder, and violence, and oppression, and tyranny that seemingly absolute power goes into absolute neurotic behavior. I would call it just toxic patriarchy, toxic. I don't want to denigrate men any more than men denigrate men, but this, this violent patriarchy, call it ignorance, mistaking evil for goodness and mistaking goodness for evil and qualifying those behaviors and funding those behaviors in the name of freedom and democracy, the perversity of our big brother allegiance to the propaganda, the, mis, the mislabeling of language to support and to fool and to baffle people that in fact 
This is what you do to defend democracy by killing innocent people around the world to support whatever it is that we're in denial of, our lifestyles, our clothing, our food. And this, this agreement to toxicity as virtue, it's no wonder that religions seek escape from the madness of the earthly plane. And yet, some of the greatest teachers alive have, have just failed in a way, beautifully failed. I mean, just for example, you know, in my own tradition of Buddhism, and you read in the traditional texts, the Tipitaka, the life of the Buddha prior to him leaving the palace and the home. He was born as a, a male in ancient India in recent times, something like 2,600 plus years ago. And very privileged, very royal driven, very elitist, you know, prince, and bestowed with all types of available actions from the most beautiful feminine delights, a woman chosen for him based upon her virtues and her physical beauty among all the women in northern India. You read in the traditional checks of how Gotama was allowed to indulge in unlimited, seemingly culturally sanctioned, family sanctioned, hyper sexual behavior. Today it would be seen as like an unthinkable outrage. It'd be, it would be seen as a kind of porn to have 30 gorgeous sexual courtesans as they're often talked about living in proximity to any second that you have an erection that you want to pursue a trans tantric multiple orgasmic experience of fantasy. Meanwhile, I don't take anything from it. You are married, whatever that marriage meant at the time, to be culturally supportive of that level of sexual dimensionality. Call it, this is beyond polyamory. I mean, I don't have any issue with any of this. Ultimately, it's a consensual issue. But these are the things that we often overlook in traditional orthodoxies of religion. The Buddha himself, to be, lived in a way that if he were in San Francisco or LA or Boston or Cincinnati or Minneapolis or in Ubud would be like, oh my God, you are like a hyper out of control, entitled, privileged narcissist, a sociopath, and so violently abusive to the divine feminine that you're in denial of to your wife. And then needless to say, he wakes up one morning on the ninth month of his wife Yasodera's pregnancy, about to give birth, he looks around his palace, and there's lots of palaces in Ubud where people live. I mean, they're just amazing places. And he just sees the whole place as if it was like a hyper orgiistic, trans psychedelic, bliss orgasmic fest of men and women who are intoxicated from the evening of bliss and whatever other substances they did, whether it be alcoholic or psychedelic or both. And there they are just wasted from joy. And the Buddha to be wakes up and goes, oh, wow, what an evening of debauchery. And meanwhile, my wife is about to give birth and there she is giving birth. And this is so taboo to talk this way. But nonetheless, it's, it's delivered to us in the most sacred Buddhist text. But it's easily overlooked and somehow normalized. But yet if we live that way, if you don't live according to the five Buddhist precepts and right speech and not lying and right, not taking which is not given to you and words that are benevolent and beautiful, if you even begin to think about judging someone else and intoxicants, my God, you know, the controversy around psychedelics, are they 
mind enhancing? Are they devi deviation from lucidity and insight? But yet the Buddha to be, he's just an ordinary prince who's just out of control to normal behaviors. And, and each of us have done this. I mean, I've, I'm not out of control, but I've, I've really allowed myself over the decades the adventure of living sexually, intimately, romantically, financially, um, travel, partnerships, poetry, music, theater, spoken word, dharma talks, meditation, travel, dress, nudity, nakedness, all the ways in which we are allowed, if we agree and find people in our lives, to embrace a more open-heartedness, to explore and to learn by overcoming psychologically sanctioned shame and remorse and doubt, and just the cult of hypocrisy and how that's denied and how that's vilified. How many teachers do I know, including the Buddha, to be, just has a moment of urgent conscience. How many teachers that I know that people are in awe of in the West and in Europe and in Asia who have just a, a long history of radical pharmaceutical and cocaine and crack cocaine, not just use, I don't like to even use the word addiction, but just they were cartel dealers. They bound hundred dollar bills and satchels. They made so much loot traveling in private jets. <laughs> And yet, it's never in the memoir, it's never in the, the orthodoxy of what an awakened, Western, integrated Dharma teacher looks like, except if you, in the last 10 years, have transgressed, where yoga teachers and mindfulness teachers and tantra teachers and Tibetan teachers, so Gyo Rinpoche, the Tibetan book of the living and dying, the most best-selling book, and I think in the history of, of modern-day spirituality, translated into numerous languages, ghost-written for him by Andrew Harvey. Those who know, know that. And just a fetish for domination, a fetish for sadomasochism, all films and photographs. I've seen some of those photographs. I know some of the people and banned from America, and just in the name of Tantra. Right or wrong, but my God, you know, you bring up these things of Trungpa Rinpoche, the founder of Naropa Institute, and his fetish for sexuality, what, two, three thousand different sexual liaisons, his heirs, Erzl Tenzin, and other people knowingly passing on the HIV AIDS virus by telling so-called partners that they're immune based upon the fidelity of their transcendent karma, their barbiturate use, their cocaine use, their alcohol use. I mean, I was there at Naropa. I saw it all. I, I, I was curious to see all these people smoking and drinking and coming back from Asia with their so-called faux enlightenments, with their incredible phantasmagorical stories of saints and all kinds of mystical powers and creating hundred dollar bills out of nowhere and duplicating bodies and and but you look at the orthodox buddhist text my own tradition of mahasi saito you read his discourses and it's so extraordinarily normalizing psychic intuitive the most unthinkable behaviors of consciousness that normalizes flying through walls, seeing minds, duplicating your bodies, states of transcendent illuminosity, deities, devas, brahma ghosts, hell worlds, deities, poltergeists, so many things in which they're not talked about because of the, I don't know why, because it's not scientific, it's not doesn't tend towards edification, but 
They're very curious for me to meet people who are willing to talk about that which isn't normally shared within their Jungian, Freudian, trans-existential, psychiatric, trans-psychedelic dialogues. Whether it be financial, whether it be sexual, even like within the Catholic Church, you know, I, the amount of Catholic-sanctioned, bliss-oriented pedophilia, and it's, it's so taboo to be a man, a priest in that tradition, any tradition, where you have a fetish for, call it, underage orifices. I know that's, oh my God, he said it. But what is pedophilia? What is forced oral sex? What is forced anal sex? What is forced multiple pedophilia sexual behavior? What is sex trafficking? What is child trafficking? The, the taboo of how many priests have gone down the road of, of deliberate, ongoing, insatiable appetites for their genitals, their penises, their fingers, and their tongues to be shoved into the unagreed upon orifices of boys and girls on the altar of a transcendent theology or religion and how that's been normalized. And we still have the Catholic Church and the hierarchy of narratives of what we are supposed to believe as the highest order of spiritual religious understanding in the cosmos. And I can't help but come back again and reboot to the sickening normalization of the word war, violence, genocide, and collective rape. And, and the collective starvation, dehumanization on a mass scale of Wall Street, of the European Union, of the white elites. And it's, it's really mind blowing to be in a war zone as infrequently as I was, but I have spent time and months and some years there and to see the fetish that girls and boys often find in the upsurge of this toxic adrenaline called nationalism and a willingness to embody and abide in a collective violence towards other, where they can abscond from their inadequacies, their lack of education, so to speak, their sexual shame, their political shame, their marginalization, their sexual orientations, and all of a sudden they have a new identity called fill in the blanks with your Nazism, your Third Reich, your, your Boko Haram, your Khmer Rouge, your Mossack in Burma, your... Yeah, the ways in which we belong to the cult of an acronym that by one standard is vilified as a terrorist group, the other side sees themselves as freedom fighters. And I mean, as R.D. Lang said, insanity is a sane response to an insane world. J.K. Krishnamurti, his famous line that it's no measure of success to be well adapted to, uh, you know, an, in, an insane society. And so it brings up the issue of like, how do I interpret my belief in orthodoxy and truth and religion and spiritual correctness? And it may be these are euphemisms for a type of ignorance and insanity. And in fact, we need to decode sacredness, decode normalcy, decode the meaning of mindfulness, decode the meaning of enlightenment, decode religiosity, decode bodhisattva. And I know there's an attempt to do that through legitimate scientific principles, but this is where the thought experiment in, in scientific 
dialogue to suspend the normalization of denied toxic in agreement with behaviors and thoughts and actions that denigrate. I mean, I was once a passionate cigarette smoker until I saw my two most beloved aunts die of emphysema at an early age, even though they had stopped smoking 30 years prior. To be with them in the decline of their ability to function and breathe blew my mind that I was agreeing to the toxic joy of nicotine stimulation and the repetitive oral fixation on that. And I just worshipped Lucky. I was like a like a like a like a, a, a like a closet gay drug addict. Lucky and I were best friends. We were like doing oral sex every day with Lucky Strike, you know, and I was like the happiest camper in the world. I could be in war zones, I could be in debauched areas of the world, I could write the most outrageously sexually, philosophically, spiritually explicit books and narratives. I got into stage, it was like, wow, Lucky and I, he enabled me to be the crazy mystical adventurer. And, and how to re-examine these behaviors. You know, just jumping along here in Burma, one of the things I loved about Mahasi Sado is that he, this is my interpretation, because the country was colonized for 121 years and literally denigrated by the white imperialists, just really outrageous. And then seven successive generations of dictatorship that just obliterated the culture with tyranny and torture, propaganda and lies and obedience. And of course, they rewarded the elites of the country that were willing to collude with the dictators. And all the businesses in Burma primarily are run by what they call cronies. And these are men and women and families of about 1,000, 2,000 families that collude with, with the succession of dictators, whether it be Ne Win or Tan Shui or the, the, the latest iteration of dictatorship, the, what's his name, uh, Hlein, which they've a synonymous, synonymous term with him is quay, dog, toxic dog. You know, they put pictures all around the country of the wild quay in the country, dogs, and they put pictures of the dictator around the dog's neck and they run wild. They're activist dogs. And, but th my point is, is that this group of elite people that run the factories, the slave labor, the garments, the plastics, the cars, the rice, the rubies, the gas, the oil, the timber, the lumber, all those organizations, those normal businesses are a conglomerate, a toxic, intersecting, evil mandala of totalitarian dictatorial oppression. And that they've co-opted Buddhist religion and made themselves on top of that toxic collage of totalitarian violent oppression, a kind of spiritual political dharma based narrative of legitimacy. And you've got the Asian boys and girls in these South Asian countries that support autocratic, toxic, oppressive obedience of the subjects called normal citizens. And it's like, wow, welcome to the world, right? And then it's supported by people like Biden, not directly in the way that we know it, but with Putin and Xi Jinping and Singaporean bankers that evade sanctions by the drones, the missiles, the supervisors, the oil, the gas, the technicians, the batteries, the airplanes, the, the helicopters that just rain down hell upon the 132 ethnic groups of Burma and the democracy, the, the, the democratic revolutionaries. 20,000 political prisoners in a revolutionary battle that's epic. Burma isn't just Burma. Burma is an, a revolutionary battle of good and evil. It's the existential battle of our lifetime, the spiritual battle of our lifetime. That's what really excites me about it. And within it, there's a matriarchal feminine inspired, often associated with Aung San Suu Kyi, but not alone. 
that Burma is a matriarchal society and these men and women are rising up every day of their lives to confront this injustice with the desire to learn from the mistakes of the culture and the, the narrative, the dictators. Reconciliation, which is right there as I come to the end, the absence of using violence in the long term to achieve our own means. And so, I guess the takeaway for me here is the willingness to open up the dialogue and to challenge the ways in which I'm unknowingly conscripted in marginalizing others, censor, censoring others, censoring myself, shame-based censorship that's mistaken for mindful presence, the normalcy of insecurity as strength and power, the bliss, joy, toxicity of denial and deception as cover acts for, for duplicity and uh, the denial of my own foibles, my hypocrisy, and beginning to open up in our dialogues with teachers and students and people along the road that, wow, we're all not flawed, but we're born into this invenerating conditions where <laughs> it's one thing to be born into conditions that are so other than the normalcy of the norm, but then to be further conformed and shaped into a constricted puppetry of white elite Western Buddhist values. And then all of a sudden you're a moving organic mannequin that pees, poos, and lies, and you're called an elite Western Buddhist teacher offering state-sanctioned, culturally sanctioned trainings to become puppets in the orthodoxy of toxic oppressive proxy murderers to killing machines around the world. And it's like, where do you find priority? So it's, we're kind of in the end of the age of teachers and gurus. We're in the end of the age of the normalization of toxic patriarchy. Obviously women around the world are standing up, speaking up, men are stepping down. And more and more, there's an acceptable dialogue to out-of-the-box trans orthodoxies of normalcy. And the Buddha left his home, bailed out on his wife and his newborn, asked his, the driver of his Maserati, at the equivalent was a a ruby-studded chariot, it was the equivalent of a Maserati or, a, or you know, a, a Telsa, a gold-studded Telsa at the time. And he drove out of the palace grounds, and he, it said that because he was protected from reality by his father, he had never seen reality up close. He had never seen an old person. And he asked his driver to stop his gold-studded Telsa, used the remote control to roll down the window and looked out the window, and he saw an old person there that was like 60, 80, 90, 110 years old, bent over, no teeth, yellow from hepatitis and disease, eyes deep in their skull, it said, and just paralyzed in anguish and pain from being alone and hungry and starving as an elder person just walking the countryside in the Gotama, all but 29 years old, asked his Telsa driver, says, what is this? Is this a hallucination? He says, no, this is normalcy, dude. This is an old person. He says, what in the hell does old mean? I've only seen beauty. I've never known that. I mean, yes, I've gotten older, but I'm only 29, but everything I look around is glistering with gold and rubies and sapphires and art and intimacy and yoni and breasts and nipples and the sexiest non-clothing imaginable and not to mention the sapiosexual language that went on that was agreed upon and all the arts and archery and painting and 
the martial arts he was involved in and the education, just, he had everything. Talk about Euro trash and Asian trash. It's like, you know, the way in which people here vilify Russians. It's, he was one. I mean, I don't do that, but it's like, what? They just rent all the Airbnbs and make it high cost for the rest of us. Well, that was Gotama, right? And he went out and said, Jesus Christ, there are local populations here that have almost nothing. They get old. He said, I can get old? Yeah, you can get old, Gotama. I mean, that's quite an awakening on a meditative psychedelic level to know that you couldn't age and all of a sudden you see someone that is aged and diseased and you go, holy shit. And to me, this, this epiphany of holy shit moments is really cool. Uh, that's where the psychedelic and the entheogen and meditation and travel and breaking the orthodoxy and experimentation become very fascinating for me is, is you know, Epiphany is trans-toxic narrative, slavery identification, cultism. You go, fuck, interrupt, interrupt Biden's war machine, interrupt Trump's fetishes, interrupt the American war machine, interrupt Wall Street, interrupt the EU, interrupt murder, interrupt Interrupt, 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 interrupt. Imagine just repeating that as a mantra. Interrupt, interrupt. In That's very different than, well, I don't know, Om Namah Shivaya. Maybe Krishna Das can do a, a new chant. Interrupt, Shivaya, interrupt. Interrupt the narrative, you know. Interrupt. Break down the walls of my obedience to genocide. Break down the walls of my obedience to pride, to sing a hymn for the Pope to retire, to step down, for these priests to make remuneration and say, hey, listen, all the money in all of Italy is yours now to restore some degree of sanity. I don't know exactly what the outcome is, but the Buddha then looked at someone who was dying. They're lying on the ground in a state of near death. Whoa, whoa. Imagine bringing a near death experience into the room here today at Usana, a corpse that's three days dead. It stinks, it's got maggots. The windows are being crashed by crows wanting to come in and eat. How many of those reels I've watched on Instagram and Facebook of those predator animals all throughout the world, they're just jumping on the backs of, of bulls and antelopes and just, ugh, that's life. I've been in jungles, I've seen it. You just can't escape unless you move and have four walls and mosquito nets and even so, boy, you're just constantly, oh my God, if these mosquito nets were to fray or the walls were to crack, I'd be eaten alive by the red army ants or by the iguanas or by the, the rats, the black snakes, always want to eat something other than themselves. And even when they get hungry, they eat their own kind. They eat their own kids. It's a flawed existence. The Buddha said that and saw that. My teachers in Burma, it's flawed, dude. Seek an exit from these conditions. The wisdom of Parinibbana, the white hole of Nibbana. It's like, what a concept is that? Thank you, Lord Buddha. Nibbana, the absence of conditioned perception as a priority over conditioned calm and equanimity. The, the, the taboo of even using the word kilesa, that by born and birth, we are embedded in toxic conditions, states of mind, greed, anger, delusion, fear, shame, restlessness, doubt, obsession, diminution, domination, obliteration, rape, murder, oppression, tyranny, fetishes. It takes our breath away to know that we're born with these conditions. One of the things that I learned in war zones is that what I vilify I could do. Didn't take hallucination and psychedelics to see that. I actually stopped seven years of Prozac use when I went to the war in Yugoslavia. It felt so inauthentic to buffer myself from the reality of what I was feeling. 
And as a result of that, it was like, what an awakening. And those are the kind of teachings that I would recommend. I don't mean going to places to just, you know, kind of voyeuristic. But it should be mandatory that our politicians and priests and teachers go volunteer without your name and your badge and your credentials and your PhDs and your trainings to Gaza, to Burma, to refugee camps, to displacement areas of the world, to Tibet, to places where you just cannot believe that you're encountering the horrors of what you're seeing and feeling, and you even have no food or clothing or medicines to give the people, and then all of a sudden you don't even have them for yourself. And then you're one of the very people that you just can't escape from. You go, oh my God, that was the Buddha's awakening where he left the palace. He saw a dead body. And his friend who was driving the Telsa said, dude, you're going to be dead one day. It could happen any minute. The flaws of existence, young monk, Uagasara, as I was called in the monastery, Anicca, Anatta, and Dukkha, they're flaws of existence. The Kalesas are flaws. It's a bad design. And you can seek the Four Noble Truths to rectify how you collude with the bad and the evil. But the more and more you see, it's so taboo to talk about the horror of classical insight and wisdom in the Theravadan tradition. To de-enthrall psyche and source and DNA from its proclivity to want to fuse an ignorant, blissful association with things that denigrate? <laughs> talk about an addiction. To go cold turkey, which is essentially the role of a meditator, is to just convulse. It's no bliss trip. Man, it is no measure of what you can say about detoxing from the enthrallment of ignorance in context to the conditioning of how greed, anger, and delusion, loba, dosa, and moha, find toxic joy with things that denigrate you and others. Why do the priests and the pedophiles and the warmongers do what they do? I think they get off on it. I think it's a sexual turn on. And why is normalized spiritual kink a taboo? I wrote a novel a couple of years ago called Extinction X-Rated, in which I just said, Alan, uncover every imaginable taboo and make it a story of good and evil. Share the unthinkable. I did that. You can read it. Some love it, some hate it. I got a new film on the horizon, which is essentially the same theme. We've got a retreat coming up in British Columbia at the esteemed Sentinel on, on the lake in Caslow, August 12th to the 18th for 17 people. Residential, the highlight of 2024 for me. And then we have a 10-day retreat here in Ubud at Arma Resort in this extraordinarily sacred area, November 24th to December 3rd, a non-residential world Dharma retreat that's offered freely to 50 to 100 people. It, it's there for those who want to participate. It's going to be online soon. The film is coming up soon. And these are my small ways of trying to contribute to a more open dialogue that doesn't normalize the good, the bad, and the ugly, but it, we begin to recoil more from our own hypocrisy. And we begin to lead with the radiance of our own self-deception as virtue. And I close here is, why is it taboo to admit a fault? Why is it taboo to to elevate the status of our hypocrisies, our idiosyncrasies, our so-called flaws as strength. It's not enough to say that authenticity rocks, but what do you see in the mirror of your honest conscience and mindfulness coming down from the pedestal of elitism and patriarchy and domination and hierarchy and the normalization of a vulnerable, beautiful inclusivity of that too, so that we de-enthrall ourselves from the protection of normalized denigration, violence, denial, war, violence, rape, and genocide, and the ongoing 
incarceration of others in the name of our sacredness, our religions, our elitism, our prosperity. Let us come back home to sacred reciprocity, a coexistence. And I cannot thank my teachers in Burma for their patience to help me understand more and more of how I could be more and more radically courageous at the front edges of my own fear, greed, and denial. And this is where the word kalesa and the beautification of consciousness, that confluence right there, they gifted me with that gift of, hey, only you can denigrate yourself. And only you can free yourself. And we use bhavana, the beautification, to awaken to the salvation of a freedom beyond racism, xenophobia, prejudice, and legitimized, globally sanctioned, UN-sanctioned genocide and war and violence. So from my heart to yours, thank you for tuning in. Stay close. I'll be returning to the West very shortly. A number of very creative projects coming up and our retreats will be online soon and stay in touch. And from my heart to yours, have a beautiful day and uh, hope to meet you somewhere down the road. Thank you so much.